you push record, let me know. I did. <laughs> this, is our, this is our way of syncing audio with video. Okay. <laughs> Some toggle of the applause. <laughs> okay. Well. Oh, you all end up being here is going to throw me all out. Before you begin, is there a handout? <coughs> no, there's no handout. Regrettably. I did think about it, uh, doing another little uh, glossary of terms, but I thought, well, there aren't that many. And, uh, I guess got lazy, basically. So, no, there's no handout tonight. And one more Although question. Although I do make, I do make my, uh, my presentation available to people who want it. Yeah. Does that happen? You mean the, the PowerPoint presentation? Yep. Yeah. That that was going to be my next question. Yeah, if you uh, if you left an email uh, with us uh, address and uh, maybe write me a little note or something, and the best, I'll yeah, the best way would be to email the, um, the email address that is. Let's see, how do they know about that question? Um, well, the, through, the mind. R I don't know. <laughs> that, through the RTB site, does that get to us? Yeah, yeah. You can email the R on the RTB site. Go to the chapters. Go to Sacramento. So contact. And there's a contact thing. If you email there, it will definitely get to us. It will get to me. Yeah. Yeah. It will get to me then to you. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 nothing I do is uh, copyrighted. Uh, since I get it from other people anyway, <laughs> most of it. So, uh, all right, we're ready then. Well, first of all, thanks for being here, all of you. Uh, it's very nice outside, the weather is very nice. It's been nice and it's going to stay nice, I think, for a while. So, I'm sure there's lots of other things you could be doing tonight. Some of them may be important things, but you chose to be here. And I just want to tell you that I appreciate that and I, I hope that uh, what we're going to be going through tonight is of value to you, not just for tonight, not just out of sake of curiosity that might be useful to you sometime. And in fact, uh, it's talking about the weather, it makes me think that uh, I hope by the time we're through here tonight, you have a whole new appreciation for the weather, even if it's not quite as comfortable as it is right now. It could be a lot hotter, a lot colder. And you'd still be very, very fortunate to be living here rather than lots of other planets <laughs> that are out there. <laughs> And you're going to find out that uh, uh, it's not, uh, and certainly in my opinion, not blind luck uh, that our planet ended up the way it did. Uh, you'll find that the number of coincidences necessary to get us to where we are in terms of the incredibly benign environment that we live in uh, are <coughs> just large, too large to, I think, describe to pure chance. But you can make that decision for yourself when planning by the time we're through. So let me just start by saying that I expect that uh, throughout most of history, uh, people have wondered whether we're alone in the universe. I mean, it's not something we, we obsess over every day, but it probably occurs to us once in a while. But the neat thing about living today is that it's only been uh, a matter of very, uh, very uh, recently that we could do more than actually speculate about whether we're alone. And in fact, the work of uh, thousands of scientists and engineers uh, have given us tools that we can use to peer a considerable distance into our own galaxy. In fact, we can uh, identify Earth-sized Earth -size planets rotating around stars hundreds or even thousands of light years away from us. And uh, scientists tell us, though the numbers vary quite a bit, but some scientists will tell us that there may be as many as 40 billion, that's a billion with a B, uh, Earth-sized planets orbiting red dwarf stars and yellow stars like our own, uh, with, that's just within our own galaxy. Uh, now in a previous presentation, actually this was in February, we looked at questions regarding the what, remember what we talked about? Uh, the origin of life on Earth. And we showed that the scientific consensus is that it's what? It's, uh, it's a mystery. No, nobody really knows. A tremendous amount of research has gone into it, and still nobody knows how life arose on the Earth. Um, but we do know that serious hurdles have to be overcome, certainly, well, certainly in my opinion, and I think RTD, is that it's, uh, that it's uh, 
so many things have to be overcome to ascribe the origin of life to anything. Um, uh, well, let me rephrase that. There are a lot of other things you have to overcome to ascribe the origin of life to purely naturalistic causes. Uh, now, in another presentation we did, now this is a long time ago, I don't know how many people in here are going to realize it, or remember this, but we did it, we saw a DVD, and I, I can't actually recall the name of it, but we looked at the microscopic world of molecular biology, you remember that? Jim? The machine, we saw incredibly complex molecular machines, yeah. and from looking at that we, we would conclude that we have good <coughs> reasons really, to infer supernatural causation for life. Now, tonight we're going to go from the very small world of molecular biology to the very large world of astronomy and geophysics. Uh, but we're, we ask the same question. Well, are we alone? Are we alone? Are we unique in the universe? Uh, certainly today, uh, careers are built. Uh, entire uh, departments at colleges and universities are supported, and, and entire industries exist just trying to answer this question. Are we alone? In fact, $600 million uh, had been spent on the Kepler spacecraft program, uh, just on that program alone, searching for Earth-like planets in a little corner of the galaxy. And it's a very small corner. As it turns out, uh, Kepler has discovered uh, almost, uh, almost, well, actually 1,750 to be exact, as of today, uh, planets. Uh, although none of these worlds has been shown or been demonstrated to be able to support uh, even microbial life. We, we have no direct evidence of anything like that. In fact, those planets which have been identified and looked at as, as closely as we can would certainly be considered to be hostile, very hostile toward life. Um, no matter that uh, for at least a few of these uh, planets, they would be orbiting in an area where we would say that liquid water could exist. Uh, and of course, this is NASA's big plan. You know, they're always looking for worlds where water can exist in liquid form on the surface. So uh, at this point, you now we might ask, well, what kinds of things do make a planet suitable for life of any kind? And we instantly have a head start on the question because we have how many data points? We have one. And that one would be, of course, our own, we would say our Earth, but I'm going to modify it a little bit and say our own Earth-Moon system, because as we'll see, uh, the fact that we have a moon, the fact that a moon was formed in the first place, uh, means an awful lot to where we <coughs> are today. Now, of course, you know, there's nothing, there aren't many things more beautiful than looking up into a clear night sky and seeing a full moon. It's almost breathtaking. If you ever look at it through a spotting scope or a real telescope, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? It's just, uh, it's so dramatic. Uh, but it just seems to sort of be there. But if you, uh, recently, science has shown, and when I say recently, I'm talking about maybe the last 30 years, uh, not very long ago, actually. Uh, science has shown that the existence of the moon and its formation, not just its existence, but its formation are of crucial importance to the ability of Earth to support advanced life and maybe a life of any kind. Now, uh, nevertheless, there are those that insist, and I read a lot of science stuff on the internet, a lot of, uh, a lot of science articles, so I know that there are a lot of people that think that life will be found to be common in the universe. Life everywhere. And they base that uh, oftentimes simply on the observation that when it comes to the Earth, almost no matter where you look, it's what? It's just life everywhere. We grow to great pains to keep life-type molecules off of spacecraft when we send them to other planets in our own solar system. Because life is ubiquitous here. It's, it's just everywhere. If you look with a powerful enough microscope, you just you see it everywhere. It's hard not to find it. So, but we ask the question, is that a reasonable assumption? Let's begin by taking a look at what is a, in, in essence or in reality a very, very broad subject 
uh, and we're just going to barely touch on it tonight, and that's this whole area of planetary habitability. <coughs> now, from our presentation in February, you'll recall that all life on Earth is based on a biochem biochemistry that relies on the existence of almost exclusively what we call left-handed amino acids and right-handed sugars. How these exclusive left-handed amino acids uh, came to be is unknown. <coughs> and there are theories that are advanced to account for it. Uh, and most of them rely on uh, laboratory conditions uh, existing on the early Earth. Or exist. It's just hard to imagine um, the, the early Earth as being as pristine as a laboratory, and that's almost how it would have to be in order for any of these ideas to have any kind of chance. And of course, as far as we know, there's what we call <coughs> homochromality. I have a question. When you say sugars, do you mean um, like ribose used to make DNA? Sure. Does that include glucose? Like, <coughs> yeah, not all sugars are, have a handedness, or chiral molecule, as we say, but some are, and most amino, mean, all except one amino acid is. That's an absolute, as far as we know, that's an absolute requirement for life. Uh, discoveries when it comes to the origin of life, uh, no one knows how living cells came to be. But uh, however it happened, we know that primitive life, like bacteria, can survive and, and even thrive in very hostile or fairly hostile conditions. From examples, again, here on Earth, if you think about deep sea vents in the ocean, you may have seen television shows about that, and we see uh, bacteria surviving at uh, a couple hundred degrees, or 300 degrees actually, Fahrenheit, immense pressures, uh, no oxygen, and they do fairly well down there. But when we look out into the galaxy, we don't see just hostile planets. We see very hostile planets. So um, next, the Earth is, uh, so far as we know, unique. Uh, the Kepler spacecraft, which is specifically out there, actually it's dead now. It's, it's officially pretty much dead. Uh, but while it was operating for a couple of years, it monitored 150,000 stars. And out of that 150,000, it managed to find 1,750 exoplanets, exo meaning outside of our solar system. And out of those, it found exactly one that was, that's very close to the size of the Earth in what we call a habitable zone, where liquid, we think liquid water could exist on its surface. <coughs> uh, and it's orbiting around a red dwarf star. I wish we could talk some more about that. But uh, anyway, that's, so the Earth is unique. That's the point to get from there. Now, what does life require? What would make a planet capable of sustaining bacterial life? What about uh, plant and animal life? What about uh, conditions that allow for intelligent life, able to create and sustain a technology-based society? The one Earth-sized planet in a habitable zone, does that have a moon? <clears throat> I, mean, I don't think they know. know. I don't think they know. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's been directly imaged. Uh, Kepler just tells us uh, that they're there. We really don't know. We really don't have much of an idea uh, about anything else unless we're able to directly image them, okay. which takes a lot of time. Okay. Because you're just going to talk about the moon and how it's necessary for yeah. life survival today, so that's why I was asking about that. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that doesn't. There, there may be other mechanisms out there. I mean, it's possible, and I'm sure if, uh, if one of our critics were here now, they would probably say something like that. So. I just don't want to get into questions of, well, what about life completely unknown to us? It's completely based on different chemistry. I don't want to get into those kind of uh, questions because those are like super rabbit trails. Actually, that's, there's an easy answer for you later. Yeah, they, yeah they actually, as far as we know, they can't. Well, anyway, we'll leave that for the after, the after meeting. Okay, so let's uh, let's start by asking. Well, where did the moon come from? Where did it come from? Okay, all stars. Would it be better if I turn one set of lights off? Probably. Yes. We'll try it. Yeah, that's better. Is that better? Try another set. 
able to read. I can't stray too far from my notes. Or else we'll be here all night. Uh, all stars, all planets, are composed of gas and star dust. I think you've probably heard that before. We're all made of this stuff. And the stuff was produced in the nuclear furnace of stars, and especially large stars that have exploded in what we call supernovas. Okay. That's where most of the heavier elements, uh, anything heavier than iron, would be produced in a supernova. Now this dust accumulates in the vicinity of exploded stars, and it begins to kind of clump in t at times. As pressure from the explosion and gravity bringing the particles together. And we see an example of this in what we call a stellar nursery, where, guess what, stars are born. Uh, and one of these is called, if we, uh, I think you can actually see this if you had a, a nice telescope at home. You could, I don't know if it would look quite this nice. This is probably something done by Hubble. This is called the Eagle Nebula. And you can see bright areas right here where there's star formation going on. <coughs> this is the dust we're talking about. Clumping together there. If the right conditions exist, uh, sections of this material can eventually form what we call an accretion disk. We'll look at this again in a minute. That begins to slowly spin. And if the conditions are right, from this disk comes a new sun. And sometimes planets orbiting it. Now this is an artist's conception right here of an accretion disk. So some of that dust, some of that material has begun to uh, accrete or come together, kind of stick together. And if the conditions are, are right, it begins to spiral. And before you know it, you have really beginnings of what you might, what you might end up being a solar system. So you end up with, uh, and of course here is the star that Looks like it has just begun its uh, fusion process, so it's glowing, shining there. And if you look closely, you kind of see, like, I don't know if you can see those from where you are, but they're little, little blobs here. I guess the art is meant for those to represent maybe planets. Uh, and um, so occasionally, and those, those planets will have moons uh, around them as well. Now, our moon, Luna, as Jim said from the Latin, is one of the largest moons in our solar system. And as we'll see, the size of our moon is a big deal. Would it really be considered planets or planetoids at that stage? Well, uh, I don't know. If, I don't think there's any clear distinction between a planet and a planetoid. Okay. Planetoids are in, in, a, in a mature solar system would be small and uh, not necessary. You know, there has to be a certain size nowadays before you're a planet. Remember, Pluto got demoted. So how many planets are there now? All the kids used to say, nine. <laughs> now you'd be wrong if you said, that's right, eight. It wasn't demoted, it was reclassified more accurately. Well, okay, if you look at it that way. I think of lots of ways that kids could be reclassified that they would consider to be <laughs> demoted. <laughs> Mom, I was demoted this year, or reclassified this year. Now, up to about 1980, there were four popular models to explain the presence of the moon. And really, one, I'm sorry you can't read this down here. I don't know how to get rid of that menu. Right there. I know if you press the menu button, it gets a lot bigger. In any case, the idea was is that, okay, so you have this sun that managed to get formed in the middle of this disk. One of the ideas is that planets uh, can uh, happen the same way. They, they, they form up in here as clumps of matter or the matter clumps together. Uh, and so the idea here is that, well, planets uh, come about by clumping of this dust together. Well, why not the moon? Why didn't the moon just sort of uh, come together around the same place the Earth was and somehow magically begin to rotate around it? That's one idea. Uh, the next one is that the Earth uh, the, the Earth was one big, one big clump and then it was spinning round and round and round, and a smaller clump just sort of split off and formed our moon. 
I thought, well, how could I possibly show that? And I thought, well, okay, let's try it. It's like a merry-go-round. And uh, by the way, do they still have these on playgrounds? I haven't seen one lately. I'm sure they're considered extremely dangerous. I was there with my grandkids. My, my remembrance of them, like, I was always the smallest kid in my class, so what I remember is being stuck on one is the bigger kids kept making it go yeah. faster and faster. And I knew I had two choices. I could either let myself be flinged off of it and risk breaking my arm or stay in the middle where I would throw up. <laughs> so I've got, I got a good analogy. You know how like, if you grab a, a child's hand and you like spin around with the child and the child like starts to fly around? It's still caught in your gravity, but... It's now separate. I don't know. Yeah. Well, if you if you spun fast enough, eventually one of you would not be able to hold on. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's the way the moon got here. Okay. So that's another idea. Now, lest you think that uh, these are uh, new contraptions, uh, there there I am on the farm in Tennessee. <laughs> this was our merry-go-round. No, that, actually, that is not me. <laughs> but it very easily yeah. could have been. <laughs> okay. So. That wasn't one of them. Okay, so the, the next one is, and one that I always kind of liked, and in this uh, theory, the moon formed separately, and it was just kind of wandering around in space until it was captured by the Earth's gravitational field. And uh, although in such a case, the Earth and the moon uh, may or may not be the same age, uh, they would almost certainly have different chemical compositions. We know that objects formed in different places within our solar system have different compositions. Why that is is beyond the scope of our discussion tonight, but we just know that's true. We might talk about that a little bit more uh, a little later. Uh, and the last and the current contender for the best idea is that a Mars-sized object, the moon formed, or rather, in this a giant impactor, you'll hear me refer to it in a couple of different ways, a giant impactor, uh, you know, it can be referred to it as uh, the, the name that scientists give it before it impacted the Earth. They give it the Greek name Thea. So you might hear that from time to time. Thea? Thea. How does that spell it? <coughs> T-H-E-I-A. Uh, I did read the, the history of it from Greek mythology, but I probably forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, no, that's one of those things that's going to have to get left out. So... Uh, in any case, that's, that is the prevailing idea. So it impacts Earth, and some of the resulting blast material was hurled into space where it uh, began to orbit around the Earth and eventually formed, pieces came together gravitationally and eventually formed the Moon. Now these are all actually reasonable models. Some of them have been around uh, since, uh, this, uh, I think one of the first ones was, uh, was uh, theorized by Charles Darwin's son. So they've been around for quite a while. And they're all reasonable models, uh, but there wasn't enough information to choose one over the other until something happened in Quiz 1969 to give us a great deal of information about the composition of the moon. And that was we brought back moon rocks. rocks. They landed on the moon and they brought <coughs> moon rocks. Really cool moon rocks. In fact, this is just how cool a moon <laughs> rock is. <laughs> I bet you've never seen anything like that. Okay, that's a small, that's just a photograph of a small section of the moon rock, and it looks very much like a rock that I might find in my backyard if I went out there with my hammer. Uh, but there are a couple of differences uh, between that rock and my backyard and this one, other than the fact that this one is a couple ounces and it's worth, well, <coughs> moon rock is worth $1.4 million an ounce. <laughs> well, how did they, how did they get to that number? Well, the courts decided they had they had to assign a value because people were stealing them, and they didn't know what to charge them with. <laughs> so, I mean, was that just theft or grand theft, or, Super or people were trying to sell rocks that weren't moon rocks? So, okay, that's fraud. But you know, how much was the fraud for? What's it worth in money? So they they actually went back and calculated uh, everything it took to bring those rocks back, to go to get them and bring them back, and they decided. It was $1.4 million. Is that 1969 dollars or is that present dollars with inflation? 
changing? I, I would have to look that up. I don't know. I couldn't afford one anyway, regardless. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, if you had one, you'd have to tell everybody what it was. I mean, nobody would know. You wouldn't want to keep a secret. And then would they believe like you? Know, you know, might be sure it's a moon rock. Might be stolen, yeah. So he decided to buy that moon rock instead of retire. Wait, okay, I have another question. Is NASA funded by tax money? Yes. So that means everybody in the U.S. owns those moon rocks. Yes. And that, so you wouldn't be able to charge... We all own the White House, too. I mean, I mean theoretically, not uh, not uh, yeah. realistically. That's correct. So the that would be public property. I I expect. Uh, theoretically speaking, not theoretically yeah. speaking. Yeah. yeah, let's try to get your hands on it. They can't account for it all, by the way. <laughs> There's lots of it. Mostly, mostly the stuff that's gone missing is stuff that we gave to surprise foreign governments, and uh, I don't know where it is anymore. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of people try to sell rocks that they said were for moon. Okay. Now, uh, down here at the bottom, we have uh, it's kind of a camera's pointed down on this. It, it's an instrument, which it's probably just as well you can't read the name because it's not something that's going to stick in your memory. It's called a, um, a thermal ionization mass spectrometer. Holy cow, what is that? Uh, very simply, it's used to date rocks. I don't know, Sean, have you ever used one of these, or have you ever been in a lab with one of these? Um, I've seen them before. I know they use them to um, do chemical analysis and things like that. Okay. Sean's our resident geologist here, so. I thought about trying to explain how the thing worked, but I thought, well, that is a, ugh, that's, that's like way too much. Got to be a fun explanation, though, sometime. Uh, if you want, really want to know, I could give you a, just, Kind of a real layman's kind of nutshell explanation after the meeting. Yeah. After the meeting. Now, using machines like this on samples of moon rocks, we've determined a fairly precise date for uh, the formation of the moon at this right here, billion years right here. So roughly 4.4 billion years ago. Now, dating the oldest uh, rocks on Earth, we get about 4.54 billion years old. And so we can see that the moon is younger than the Earth by roughly 10 to 20 million years. If you have a different number, I'm going to say, okay, because I know there are other numbers. I've seen them up to 100 million years down here. And I think some of RTB literature puts them up in that range, 70 or 90, I can't remember. And then the important thing to remember here is that the, young, the Earth, the moon rather, is younger than the Earth. <laughs> By the way, when we say, talk about rocks being younger or older. Can we give me a clue? Sean can't answer, because I know he knows the answer. Uh, what makes one rock older than another one? Since it's been remelted. They all came from the same place. Since it's been remelted? Exactly. Yeah. All that means is that's when the, the rock was last in the molten state. Okay. Remember we, we had a presentation? So I'm just talking about rate of dating. Rock. Yeah. Hmm? How do you do a conglomerate rock then? Well, you just have to be careful of the sample that you get. Okay. Not all rocks can be dated successfully. That's very true. In fact, our, our, uh, our friends in the Young Earth uh, side of things uh, are very much, are very happy to point that out, that many samples uh, cannot be dated uh, with any kind of accuracy or uh, any kind of an expectation of getting a reasonable answer or consistent answers. And of course, the answer to that would be, well, you, it's true that you can't date any rock successfully. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so this gets us, uh, this leaves us with the captured moon and the giant impactor theory. So how do we know the giant impactor theory is correct? How do we know that some object didn't miss? crash into the earth and cause the moon. But we have some pretty, actually we have some pretty good evidence that that's exactly what happened. Okay. I'll take a deep breath here. <coughs> Similarities between the earth's rotation and the moon's orbit. This gets very complex in terms of mathematics if you go much further into it than what I've showed you right here. 
But I'm going to give you an analogy here, which I think is a good one. And it just takes the whole problem into a much simpler uh, realm that I think we could all understand. If someone were to hand us a photograph of a pool table immediately after two or more balls were struck, and we were given each ball's speed and exact direction, we could work backwards, actually fairly easily, and determine uh, that the, uh, a lot about the collision that caused that. The same with the Earth and the Moon. Now the Earth and this giant impactor, Theta, aren't billiard balls. <laughs> They're a lot more complex. And you're working in a three-dimensional system of space. So things get rather complex, but you use the same principle. <coughs> so when scientists look at the rotation of the Earth, and the way the moon orbits around us, they say, you know what, that looks kind of like what one would expect if somebody, if the Earth were sitting here spinning and then something came along and kind of <clears throat> crashed into it. That's what we would expect to see. So, uh, also, now, this again gets a little complicated, and I'll try to make it as simple as I can. <coughs> Identical stable isotope ratios. What that means is that object, objects formed at the same distance relative to the sun in the early, very earliest parts of the formation <coughs> of the solar system. That's really confusing to me. It would be. I understand. Okay, let me, let me go on and we'll see if it gets any better. <laughs> if you go over here to the periodic chart, here's oxygen right here. This has an atomic mass of well, if someone were to ask you, what's the atomic mass of oxygen, you would say, 16. if you knew, you would say 16. <laughs> okay, and why? Because it has, in its nucleus, it has eight protons. Yeah, but nobody tells you 16. But if you notice on this chart over here, the atomic, the atomic mass, they have 15.9994. <laughs> well, well, how in the world did they get that? Well, that's because oxygen... 16 is by far the most common atom of oxygen in the universe. Well, here, we'll, call it, we'll just limit it to our solar system. It's probably that way everywhere. There are other what we call stable isotopes that have an atomic weight of 17 and 18. Are those really stable? They are stable. Yes, they are. They okay. are stable. They're not ra in other words, they're not radioactive. Uh, they, they like just the way they are. They stay just the way they are. You're breathing some of them in right now. Great. <laughs> You're breathing some of them in right now. You're breathing some of them in right now. Your body doesn't know the difference. They're chemically essentially identical. And these other isotopes form a very, very small percentage of the oxygen around us. But it turns out the ratios, in other words, if you were to take a rock and analyze it very closely, which we can do really, really well now, you can determine what the ratio is between those different isotopes. And what those, what those ratios tell us is the processes that that, that item went through to get to where it is. And one of those is where, where it comes from in our solar system. We actually can tell where rocks come from in our solar system by looking at these ratios. Okay, in the case of uh, oxygen isotopes, we can tell the difference, for example, between a rock that comes, well, from my backyard, tell that from a rock that comes from Mars. It turns out a rock from Mars has vastly different oxygen isotope ratios. That's, that's how we do that. And it turns out that those ratios uh, between the Earth and the Moon are uh, exactly, exactly the same. Okay, I'm sure there was a reason. Oh, okay. But, Wait a minute. This is the worst page, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
if the Earth and the Moon formed at the same place in the solar system, same distance from the Sun, rather, doesn't that mean that our idea of the Earth and the Moon forming in place, that is the Earth and the Moon formed at the same time, same place, is now more credible. No, it, what it really means is that the impactor, this Thea, might have formed in the same orbit around the Sun as the Earth. How can that happen? See, this is where you would really need to put your... I had to do a shift F5 to get back here. What did I do here? Why is it doing that? Because you're not... You're not oh, I'm not in the... Oh, Okay, <coughs> looking down on our solar system, Sun, inner planets, Earth, way out here, Jupiter, Cir nearly almost a uh, circular orbit. Say Earth, let's just say Jupiter is orbiting around the Sun this way. What you see here in these white dots and these green dots are asteroids and these kind of gold dots. Those are all asteroids. You notice that Jupiter is not alone in its orbit. You have these kind of clumps of asteroids here and here. And as it turns out, this one, if Jupiter is orbiting this way, this, this clump here would say leading Jupiter, and this clump here is lagging in the orbit. But they're really happy there. So L4 and L5 are common to all planetary orbits? Yes. I know there's an L4 and L5 with the moon. There's L5 society that wants to do There's actually L1 through L5, but we're not going to get into those others tonight. <coughs> those are called Trojan asteroids? Those are called Trojan asteroids, uh, and they, they're at an area called... These are, if, you were to, if you were to describe a point where that these kind of clump around, that's the theoretical real point. It's called a Lagrange point. Now, okay. The theory for the impactor that struck Earth is that one of the that, that object formed at one of Earth's Trojan points. See, it's in the same orbit, essentially, the same orbit. But instead of these, which are just kind of happy in this at this stage of the solar system's evolution, these asteroids are well, occasionally one breaks free, occasionally one gets knocked free, and they get to start roaming around in here, which is not a good thing for us, by the way. Uh, but for the most part, they're happy where they are. Now, so the idea is that Earth, Earth had these as well at one time, but in Earth's case, in the early part of the evolution of the solar system, well, one of those asteroids just kind of kept growing and growing and growing. Well, the theory behind this, again, is it's very complex, but if one of the objects grows too large, it, it becomes unstable. It doesn't want to stay there anymore, and it moves out. And so this is the idea that one of these, that this may have been what impacted our Earth, is one of these objects in Earth's, uh, as part of Earth's Trojan asteroids, and it ended up impacting the Earth. So it comes from the same orbit, so it's in the same relative distance from the Sun, so you get well, pretty much the same materials that it's made out of. Does this sort of make sense? By the way, uh, they have actually located asteroids at Earth's Lagrange points now. They're hard to see because they don't, they don't have any light, they don't shine the light of their own, and they have to, you have to see them with reflected light, and that's not easy with asteroids. Well, is one of the Lagrange points like, different in its quantity of asteroids from the other further Earth? Because if this is the case, if that's where the moon came from, it had to come from one of those. Yeah, well, that's the idea. It, it, it would have come so from one, probably one, probably one of these, what we call L4 or L5. Yeah, but we should be able to measure them and see which ones, if one's depleted. Well, no, because okay. they, they are they're both depleted in the Earth's case. First of all, they're very hard to find, and one has only been found recently. Okay. Uh, I forgot my question. Oh, sorry. oh um, yeah, meteorites. What are these compared to, like, the meteorite showers? 
like because those we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to talk about meteors here in a, in a short while. Okay. And if you have a specific question, then you would raise your hand. And we'll okay. Touch on that. Okay. Well, let's go back. It says, as it turns out, the chemistry of the moon and Earth's outer layers are the same. If the moon came from somewhere else, you know, it's in the outer reaches of the solar system and sort of made its way in, got thrown in by Jupiter or something like that, this would not be the case. But if it as it was as the result of a collision, a big collision, where the part where pieces of each one mixed, this is kind of the, what you would expect. What does all this have to do with the requirements for life? That was all preamble there. Now the moon can be something of a pain to, astron to astronomers. You know, we think it's pretty, but the astronomers don't really like it very much when they're doing their work. They might figure out why that is. It's too bright. It's way too bright. Even though it's reflected light, anytime they, they swing their telescopes anywhere near the moon, it just drowns everything out. So, except it's limited times, uh, there are times uh, when it's okay, but it does make observation of faraway objects uh, difficult, and sometimes even impossible. But it's much darker than it could be. Uh, that's true. Uh, now, these kinds of things are easy to understand, uh, even for not astronomers, but not so easy are many of the things we never heard about. But, ne but nevertheless, uh, uh, or unless we make a study of such things. <clears throat> but what we want to recognize today is that some of these things, this is an important point, some of these things are crucial to life on this planet, and especially to advanced life. Well, let's take a look at some of the things. What happened when this impactor crashed into Earth? Okay, first of all, uh, a key factor, though it isn't the only one, in the ability for any <coughs> planet to retain an atmosphere, okay? You realize our atmosphere doesn't really go very high. You go how far this way and you die, unless you wear, unless you have oxygen. But you're five miles, maybe. Yeah, about three miles. Three? About three miles. That's going to be over 15,000 feet. About three miles that way and you're done. So we don't. The atmosphere of the Earth, although theoretically it extends to like 100,000 feet, uh, the vast majority of it is much, much, much closer. What causes, how does that atmosphere stay here? <laughs> why doesn't it just sort of, get, why doesn't the Earth just sort of leave it behind? Why doesn't it just sort of drift off into space? But it's kind of the same reason that I don't just sort of drift off into space. The, reason, the same reason that I don't get sort of left behind with the moon traveling thousands of miles per hour. It's called gravity. So, uh, this is one reason, one reason, that Mars, they think Mars has no atmosphere. It just simply wasn't massive enough to have enough gravity to hold on to its atmosphere. But there is one other factor, uh, and that it goes along with the idea that the sun is, is not always our friend. And when I say that, I don't mean because we occasionally get sunburned. Uh, I, I mean it's because a stream of charged particles is being constantly emitted by the sun. And we call this, anybody know what we call this? Solar wind. Solar, solar wind, exactly. And over a long period of time, these uh, particles can strip away the atmosphere of an entire planet through a process called sputtering. And uh, we have what I think is a good example of that. And uh, let's, let's see if I can actually get this to work. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to get the speakers <coughs> to work up here tonight. So we're going to have to use this little box. And so you might have to listen closely. <coughs> when you take a look at Mars, you probably wouldn't think that it looks like a very nice place to live. It's dry, it's dusty, and there's practically no atmosphere. 
but some scientists think that Mars may have once looked like a much nicer place to live, with a thicker atmosphere, cloudy skies, and possibly even liquid water flowing over the surface. So how do you go from something like this to something like this? NASA's Maven spacecraft will give us a clearer idea of how Mars lost its atmosphere, and scientists think that several processes have had an impact. One of these processes is called sputtering, where atoms are knocked away from the atmosphere due to impacts from energetic particles. In our solar system, the sun constantly emits high-energy photons. When one of these photons enters the atmosphere of a planet, it can crash into a molecule, knocking loose an electron and turning it into an ion. Ions by themselves don't do much, but when a magnetic field is nearby, they'll spin around the field. Conveniently, the sun generates a giant magnetic field that is carried by the solar wind. As the magnetic field sweeps past the planet, some ions will get carried away. Other ions, depending on where they form, won't get carried away, but will hit the top of the atmosphere. These ions can then crash into other molecules and fling atoms everywhere, like a cue ball in a game of pool. Some of these atoms can be knocked, or sputtered, into space, causing atmospheric loss. And over billions of years, this could have caused quite a bit of change, especially since the solar wind may have been more intense early in our solar system's history. Scientists think that all of this may have caused Mars to gradually transform from what may have been a very nice place to live into the dry, dusty world we know today. And Maven will study this process and tell us how it really works. Okay, that spacecraft is supposed to arrive uh, on, at Mars this year. So, which spacecraft? It's called Maven, M-A-V-E-N. I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's basically there to uh, look at the atmosphere of Mars and see if we can determine, make a better determination about what happened to it. We're looking at the interaction of Mars' atmosphere with the solar wind. Um, if an atmosphere is stripped enough, does the solar wind then begin to um, affect other things and cause them to leave? Like, for example, the uh, some of I think Mars has a tiny bit of frozen water still at some of its uh, mm -hmm. ice caps, but that um, the I think it was the water sublimates uh, and uh, boils at the same temperature. <coughs> and so could the solar wind knock loose the rest of Mars' water after its atmosphere is completely Well, I, I, I'm kind of guessing at this point, but uh, I would say at the surface, probably the gravity is considered, well, <coughs> the problem is, is there is essentially no atmosphere now. I mean, there is an atmosphere there, but it's very, 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 very deep, or it's very small. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what effect uh, the solar wind has on, on what little remaining atmosphere it has. But the important thing is that with the kind of Mars atmosphere that Mars has, it's a dead planet. And if we had a similar atmosphere, then we would be dead. Our, our planet would be dead as well. Okay, and uh, theoretically speaking, if people decide to colonize Mars, could they, by adding gases, <coughs> create a new atmosphere? Because that would take a really long time to get sputtered off. Uh, well, you know, you, of course you'd have to ask yourself, what, what would you make the atmosphere from? And the only things that are available are the minerals that are on the surface of Mars now, what we can dig out, and what atmospheric components are in that. Like, why do they call it the red planet? Because it's iron oxide. So in other words, you've got <coughs> oxidized iron that makes up a large portion of the crust of Mars. Could you liberate that oxygen and create an oxygen atmosphere in Mars? Yeah, sure. If you maybe got 100 and 500 fusion plants operating uh, uh, all together on the surface and then who tasked with no other job than that. Uh, the whole idea of, ch of, of changing a planet's atmosphere or characteristics of, characteristics of a planet like that is, is uh, it's interesting, it's fun to talk about. I, I love science fiction, I read stuff like that all the time. But uh, is it practical uh, with the kinds of technology we have today? Absolutely not. Okay, I meant theoretically, if somehow an atmosphere, let's say you're a god and you created a new atmosphere for Mars immediately right now, would that atmosphere take another several billion years to sputter off? Um, or would Mars' gravity... Probably, it, it would eventually leave because of the gravity and because of sputtering, yes. It, it, becomes, a, it becomes a cortisol. Yeah, and, and, and of course, 
what I'm getting to, what I'm leading up to here, is why doesn't that happen to us? <clears throat> That's probably a better question yet. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's talk about that. And can I just interrupt for a minute? Let's try to keep the questions down until we're <coughs> done, because otherwise we're, he's not going to be able to finish, and we, we won't have his conclusion. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Okay. What? Uh, okay. What keeps this from uh, sputtering? Or what keeps our atmosphere from sputtering away? Well, the reason we keep our atmosphere isn't just because of gravity. I mean, that's a big part of it. Uh, but when the Earth spins. Uh, the uh, motion creates currents within the core. We have a liquid core, right, in this planet, a liquid iron core, mostly iron. And what happens when that, that liquid starts circulating? Well, anytime you get a conductor of electricity that starts circulating like that, uh, you can very easily end up with a magnetic field. And the Earth has a very, relatively speaking, a very strong magnetic field, <coughs> just like the electromagnet the kids make uh, for science fair. If you've ever seen them, uh, it's the same kind of thing, same idea. Uh, as you saw on the video, uh, whenever a uh, charged particle encounters a magnetic field, there's a force exerted on the particle. Now, near the Earth itself, Earth's field is much more intense than the magnetic field of the Sun. And the net effect of this is that when a charged particle comes near the Earth, near the Earth, when that charged particle comes near the Earth, it just goes right around us. Uh, at least it, that's what happens in the vast, the vast majority of time. So that's one of the ways that we're able to keep our atmosphere. Mars does not have a liquid core, as far as we know. It has, and we have measured it. It has no significant magnetic field. So that's what killed Mars off, well, one of the things. Okay. Now this liquid core, the Earth is very old, as you know. Why hasn't the, 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 the Moon started out, we think, with a liquid core. Mars started out with a liquid core. They are no longer liquid. They are solid. Why is the Earth's core still liquid. Remember I said it was circulating around and that's what's creating this magnetic field. Why is it still liquid? It hasn't cooled down because the Earth's core also contains not just iron but radioactive materials. Very much like a nuclear reactor, the core of the Earth is kept molten by the heat released uh, uh, by the radioactive decay of a number of elements but primarily uranium just like in an atomic bomb, uranium and thorium in this case. And uh, as I say, without this heat source, the Earth's core would be dead. In fact, the Earth itself would be dead. Uh, it would be as dry and dusty as the moon, as dry as dusty as Mars. Now, when, these, when this impactor struck Earth, we think it had a core, a fairly good-sized core that was made up of iron and uranium and thorium. When it struck the Earth, those being the heaviest parts of the planet, the Earth basically absorbed the vast majority of the liquid core of the impactor. And so our core grew in size, including these radioactive elements, and that's why we're still muddling along. And of course, we get back to that's why we have our magnetic field. And uh, it also enables a very important feature of our planet, this whole idea of a liquid core is so, so important. And the next thing you, I'm sure you have heard of, but I'm not sure you realize just how important it is. By the way, I apologize for this lame slide. <laughs> this is, I, I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> it looks it's it's really like something that you do for the elementary school kids. You know? It looks like, like a... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are lots of other slides depicting plate tectonics, but they're so detailed that I thought, oh my goodness, I, I could never put that up here because then I'll feel compelled to try to explain it all, and I can't do that. What's the idea? The Earth has this uh, 
This is not really the liquid core here. This is called the mantle of the Earth. And it's, uh, it's not liquid, but neither is it completely solid. It's a sort of kind of halfway in between there. And the idea is that it's almost like a, uh, like a rock, like an ocean of rock. And our continents basically float around on top of it. And occasionally continents come together. I mean, I remember even as a kid, you remember this? Even as a kid looking at a map and noticing that South America looked like it would fit into Africa? Yeah. Remember that? I always wondered about that. Well, that's because they probably, they did fit together at one time. And because of plate tectonics, they split apart, and then they, they floated to their current position. But there are some very, very important attributes of plate tectonics that I, I wish we had time to get into, but we don't. So you're just going to have to take my word for it. <coughs> One of the most important things that plate tectonics does is it regulates the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere. So you might think, well, what in the world could one have to do with the other? Well, the, the idea is that CO2 is dissolved in ocean water. Not very much of it at a time, but it does get dissolved. Plate tectonics uh, causes that carbon dioxide to react with other stuff that's already in the ocean, and that becomes part of the ocean sediments. Plate tectonics buries that CO2 down under the crust of the Earth. So, this does not happen in a year or two. <laughs> this whole process can take 10 to 100 million years. So, if you're worried about global warming, don't think that plate tectonics is going to come to rescue. It, it isn't. But if you look at the Earth long term, You're wondering, how does the, how does the Earth maintain a, a rather constant temperature at its surface? This is one of the ways that it happens. This regulation of the CO2, which is a greenhouse gas, right? We know that. We, it, you can't avoid hearing about global warming. It's impossible. So we all know that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It causes the Earth to heat up. But <coughs> plate tectonics actually regulates the amount to compensate for changing temperatures for other reasons, notably the, the sun getting brighter as time goes along. The other thing is uh, that elements on the crust of the Earth, uh, as time goes along and more and more chemical reactions occur, elements that are necessary for life tend to um, get bound up, and they're not really usable anymore. Plate tectonics essentially recycles all these components of the crust by burying them and then later we have upwelling into mid-ocean ridges, we have volcanoes, that's how it all gets back out again. And uh, that's we basically recycle elements on the earth through plate tectron tectonics. Both of these are, this is absolutely critical, both of these are critical to life on this planet. <coughs> And it all goes back to plate tectonics, which goes back to a liquid core, which goes back to why is it still liquid? Because of the radioactive elements. Where did the radioactive elements come from? They came from this impactor, where the extra amounts did. So you see, it all goes back. It all goes back. Okay. We got one other thing on this slide. Okay. If we were to set foot on Venus right now without serious protection, can anybody give me an idea of what would happen? We would cough a lot. Oh, there Venus a little, out there. Hmm? We would cough a lot or a little. And then yeah, you cough a lot. <laughs> you probably didn't get the one breath in. <laughs> uh, first of all, it's really hot. Nothing about lead. 750, 800 degrees Fahrenheit. I used to solder a lot. I know when your soldering iron is set at that temperature, you touch it to your finger, it really hurts. <laughs> it hurts even more if you grab hold of the end like I did once, they could have a cold. Uh, so uh, you would not like that. But beyond that, uh, the atmospheric pressure of Venus is about a hundred times what the Earth's is. So in other words, right now the Earth uh, is about roughly 14 and a half pounds per square inch. So every square inch of your body has about 14 pounds of air pressure pushing on it. 
imagine that was three quarters of a ton. And I just step outside your spaceship with a space suit, nice, good space suit on, and yes, you're squashed like a bug on Venus, or like a pancake. Uh, many, many researchers uh, believe that the Earth's atmosphere, its early atmosphere, this is before the impact, was composed of mainly of water vapor, CO2, and nitrogen, in the same kind of runaway greenhouse effect that we find on Venus today. You know, at the surface of Venus, you don't see the sun. The atmosphere is just too thick. And at this time of the Earth's history, this very early on in the Earth's history, scientists think we had the same situation. The surface was boiling hot. Uh, and the atmospheric pressure, I've seen uh, estimates up to 250 atmospheres, two and a half times what Venus is today. Completely unlivable. Nothing involving life is going to happen in that kind of situation. Uh, so, uh, so what happened? The mouse confusion up here. This, uh, Jim Merrill will probably recognize this slide. Uh, took that from his presentation last month. It's just very slightly modified. Uh, so, this the, the, the big splash, which is what Jim titled this, and the, the, the Earth uh, at one time they thought had a great deal of water on it, uh, and by the way, more is when it comes to water on a planet. We <coughs> hear a lot of times when uh, you watch these science shows and they're talking about the early Earth and uh, asteroids came and seeded the Earth and with what and with what. Well, one of the things they talk about is water. Oh, and and, and it sounds like they're saying. Oh, we got more, we got more, and it was just wonderful that we had <coughs> water. But in fact, more is, when it comes to water, more is not better when it comes to a planet. Uh, now, Jim will remember, I don't recall the, whether these are by weight or by percentage or what, but uh, <laughs> what you really want to see, ideally, is a situation where less than 0.05% uh, is, is water. And they estimate the Earth at one point was about 20%. Way, way, way too much water. But when this impactor uh, struck the Earth, when you, you can imagine the energy released here. Water is considered to be a volatile. Because it's something that, that easily boils away. So the idea is that the vast majority of the water on Earth was boiled away, was boiled, became vapor, and was lost to space. And ammonia, too. Ammonia would be considered a volatile as well. And, and some of the lighter elements as well. But actually, both the Earth and the Moon are both vol very volatile poor. That's not a bad thing. OK. Next. Big splash. I like that. Okay, two more. Stabilization of Earth's tilt. The Earth is, of course, tilted on its axis. And uh, because it's tilted, we get, we get what? Some of the winter seasons. I heard seasons. You may want to second that. <laughs> That's why we get seasons. Now, uh, I, for a long time, was confused about seasons. I could never figure out how seasons work. People would say, well, it's because the Earth is tilted. And I would say, well, so what? Uh, but the reason that I couldn't figure it out is because I always thought that the Earth was tilted with respect to the sun. You know, like here. Here's the sun. And let's just say it's tilted like this. I thought no matter where it was in its orbit, here's the sun. It just stayed tilted toward the sun in, in <coughs> the same angle. Well, you can't have seasons that way. That won't work. So the idea is it's not tilted with respect to the sun. If you draw a line between the sun and the earth, here it is, summer and winter. You draw a line straight through there, that's called the ecliptic. That's what astronomers call that line. If you look at it above, it's a plane. It's tilted with respect to the ecliptic plane. 
So you can see now very easily that when it's summer in the northern hemisphere, right? The Earth is tilted, the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun. Six months later, the, su the southern hemisphere here is tilted toward the sun. So, you now, see, seasons are easy. But here's the thing. Earth is currently tilted. It's hard to read this, I know. But it's 23.4 degrees with respect to the ecliptic. <coughs> but the tilt varies from 21.5 to 24.5 degrees. So you're thinking, big deal, who cares? A degree or two, one way or the other, who cares? And by the way, that's over 41,000 years. Oh, now, like, I really care. <laughs> it varies two degrees, a couple of degrees, over 41,000 years. Big deal. Doesn't sound like much of a change to me. However, it may very well explain long-term changes in Earth's climate. Uh, from very, very warm, and much warmer than we are today, to an Earth that's essentially a snowball. Can you imagine if <coughs> you live in a world where virtually every square foot of the world is covered with ice? Not happening. Not an advanced society, or society, not an advanced uh, life. Okay. What if the tilt were different? What if the earth, what if there was no tilt at all? What if it was just going kind of straight up and down here? So you can see then as the, as the earth goes around and around, there, there are no seasons. There's no seasons. What if the earth was tilted clear over onto its side here? That would be it. Half the year, one side of the Earth is in sunlight. And the other half, it's completely dark. It's almost completely dark. <laughs> that's not a good situation. Uh, the, side, the side that's facing away from the sun, every blade of grass dies. Every tree dies. Because it can't stand a dark pillow. So you see, uh, it's not, it, the, the fact is we have a very, a very benign tilt. Not only that, it doesn't change very much. So the question is, well, okay, that's, that's a nice thing, I guess, but, but so what? Uh, why, why doesn't our tilt change very much? Well, uh, by the way, the Earth's tilt changes hardly at all compared to other planets in our solar system. Mars is something like 41 degrees over a long period of time. But, but over the long haul, you know, when you look at life on the Earth, it's been around for a long time. And you can see, uh, you know, progression in life. Well, if you have these alternating periods of really, really hot weather, I'm talking about weather that could be hot enough to boil water, to weather that's close enough, uh, weather that's uh, cool enough to freeze water, that's not a good thing for life over the long term. So why does the Earth's tilt stay pretty much the same? It's because of the moon. Uh, other bodies in the solar system, the sun, Jupiter mainly, exert a force on the Earth. And what they tend to do is change <coughs> the Earth's tilt. As I said earlier, our moon is very large compared to other moons in our solar system. It's, it's the largest moon in the solar system compared to our size. In fact, it's larger by a factor of 50 than the next largest ratio. Because the moon is so close and so large, its effect on, on the Earth dominates. So the sun and a planet like Jupiter has relatively little effect. Because the moon is over there saying, he's the big dog, right? So nobody else can change it very much. So that's another thing that happened as a result of this giant impact. We have a large moon, relatively close, and it stabilizes the Earth's tilt. One more. Scientists uh, estimate that the Earth's original rotation rate uh, was between two and six hours to rotate completely. That is like way fast. <laughs> it's, it's too fast. 
uh, what happens is you rotation rate that fast uh, on a world where the, the crust of the earth is floating on the mantle, basically, is you get incredible stresses within the crust. And so you get intense earthquake uh, activity and volcanic activity. Uh, you never, never have a, an advanced society, an advanced life, be able to deal with that kind of uh, cataclysmic type happenings going on all the time. So, the moon slowed the Earth's rotational period down to a very reasonable 24 hours. Okay, let me give you a real quick quote here. There's a website run by UC San Diego called phys.org, P-H-Y-S dash-org, or dash O-R-G. Uh, and they, they uh, kind of a clearinghouse for scientific studies. Uh, I was looking on there the other day and I came across this. Uh, planetary scientists think that without the moon, uh, I think it's just phys-org. Um, you know what, I don't, ask me afterwards, I've got a footnote here, or, or an end note, I'll look, look for you, because I've got it there. Um, Planetary scientists think that without the moon, the Earth would spin more rapidly, days would be shorter, weather more violent, climate more chaotic and extreme, in fact. Now this is coming from the perspective of people who are, who are committed evolutionists. In fact, it might have been such a harsh world, it would never, it would have, it would have been unfit for human evolution. So you see, from their perspective, uh, there are limits, even limits, to Darwinian evolution to be able to adapt to different conditions. And one of those is a, sh a short enough day and you don't get advanced life. Okay, fine-tuning of the impact itself. Okay, what about the nature of the impact? Okay, the Earth is pelted with objects from space every day. We, we probably all know this. Uh, Meteoroids, meteorites. Uh, and occasionally they're of significant size, but uh, again, regardless of how, of how large they are, they impact the Earth uh, in about the same range of speeds, anywhere from about 25,000 miles per hour, which is fast, up to 160,000 miles per hour, which is like heck of fast, <laughs> as the kids would have said a couple years ago. Um, uh, so, and of course, objects, uh, typical objects like this, they don't hit the Earth's surface as fast since they're slowed down by the atmosphere. And in fact, many of them are burned up in the atmosphere. So here's the key part. An atmosphere is not going to slow down an object of planetary size. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. When one planet smacks into another, the, the atmosphere doesn't help no matter how thick it is. Uh, scientists, again, looking back at the, at the current dynamics of the Earth-Moon system, estimate that the impactor must have hit oops, at less than 9,000 miles per hour, which is far less than the minimum speed that the American Meteor Society tells us that meteors, <coughs> meteoroids, hit our atmosphere. They said slower than meteoroids? Much slower. Uh, the, <coughs> slowest, the slowest uh, meteoroids that come in contact with the Earth's atmosphere are about 25,000 miles per hour when they first contacted. This object must have been less than 9,000. Okay. Likewise, uh, mathematical models and actually experimental data. Uh, NASA does experiments. They take, they take objects similar in, in uh, well, not similar in size, but in model experiments where they impact a modeled Earth with a modeled Theta. And they estimated that the impact angle had to have been very close to 45 degrees. If you had a more direct impact, that is one striking the other theater <coughs> directly, uh, you would have had the destruction of both bodies and a more hit glancing blow, and the heavy atmosphere of Earth would not have been uh, dragged away, not, not have been taken away, nor would you have had the uh, transfer of you know, iron, uranium, thorium to the core of the Earth. So that would have been a problem. So you, you have to have these, again, we see this fine tuning. And last, uh, you can't just, couldn't just strike the Earth with, with something of any size. 
In fact, it had to be very close to about <coughs> one tenth the mass of the Earth. Okay, now this is kind of fun. Uh, this is a computer simulation, or it will be when we start it, of the impact itself. This was done by Dr. Robin Canna. She's an astrophysicist at Southwest Research Institute. And uh, you're going to see this impact and, um, and the immediate aftermath of it. Now, I need to tell you a couple of things before you see it. The video is less than a minute, 50 something seconds. Uh, and it compresses the 24 hours from the impact uh, forward for the, and fits it into that 50 something seconds. So, you know, obviously when this happened, it was much slower than what you're going to see here. Let me tell you a couple more things. Because when I start this, everything's going to happen very quickly. When, when this, this, here's the impactor, here's the earth. It's going to immediately hit. So, uh, the colors, you're going to see colors in this. And they, the colors are temperatures, represent temperatures. Blue is the coolest which before they impact, they're, they're, they're cool, relatively speaking, they're cool. And it goes from green, which is next to coolest, to yellow, which is quite hot, to red, which is very hot. That's about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is enough to uh, liquefy uh, any of the elements. Now, you're not going to see the actual formation of the moon. Uh, estimates vary uh, as to how long that took after the impact. Some people think it might have taken about a year, as little as a year. But even the long estimates go up to about 100 years, which is fantastically fast, I thought. So you're not going to see that because the length of the video, just you can't compress it like that. And probably she would have used too much computer time, <laughs> would be my guess. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and click it. If you, if you really want to see it again, we can. And I'm going to try to narrate a little bit while it's going on, and hopefully I won't detract from the actual video. <clears throat> okay, ready? Here we go. Bang. Okay, everything gets real hot. You see this trail of debris here? Here's a little part that coalesced. It gets pulled back to the Earth by the Earth's gravity, and it crashes into the Earth again. Now these pieces out here are <laughs> coalescing just because of gravity into smaller bodies out here, and you're going to see a, a, a one come up about right here. I want you to watch what happens to this. It doesn't strike the Earth, but it comes very near. Now remember, it's almost molten. What did the Earth do? It just stretches it out into a long band. <coughs> so, there we are. How many people's eyes are still doing this? <laughs> so there was actually some of that particle that escaped went outside the uh, gravitational pull, didn't it? it actually well, they don't really show, you know, what, uh, you don't really know how far away. Uh, some of it certainly was ejected into space. Uh, hmm. Again, so they know, like they know right approximately through. what the mass of the Earth was and the impactors. So, uh, most of it did, in fact, coalesce into the moon. <clears throat> now, you know, we think of gravity as... I mean, we're really close, but you know, even when you get into outer space, gravity still has an effect. And so, unless you've reached escape velocity, which is, I remember, 17,000 miles an hour, from uh, Earth. That's a black hole. Hmm? From Earth, you mean? From Earth, yeah. That's, that's why it had to be traveling less than 9,000 miles per hour, so I think I much know. didn't escape then. Yeah, I, I don't know. What what are the young earthers explanation of the formation of the moon? I don't I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. Well, or, or, the, or the fact that I'm, I'm going to guess here. that it was it was just. A, God, well, I, I can tell you I, I saw some recently. I think it probably was from Ken Ham, the young earth camp, but he basically was mocking this model, saying it just he just thought it was ridiculous. Yeah, I would so imagine them doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but did he have an, an explanation? It was just supernatural miracle. There you go. What about the explanation that the, the moon doesn't rotate? How is that explained? With, oh, with our the fact moon? that it's always facing the Earth. Right. 
Uh, tightly locked. That's right. It's uh, not that's, the, that's the term that she used. Um, it happens because uh, uh, trying not to get. I can't get very deep into it. You like to think of the Earth as being consistent all the way through. You know, it's homogeneous all the way through. So if I took a circle this big, I could say, well, the center of that circle is right there. And if it was perfectly circular, I could point my finger right exactly in the middle, figure out where, where that was, and say, that's the center of the circle. But if you take something three-dimensional like a planet, and you ask yourself, okay, but, oh, here's my favorite example. What, who does the, 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 the road, like the parades, the rose parade? Who's always on there with the little bicycles and where the wheels are going? It's, who are those guys? <laughs> the wheels are off center, <laughs> right? And it causes their bicycles to do this as they ride them. Well, you take the mass of the Earth, the, the center of mass of the Earth is not at the geometric center of the Earth. Because the Earth is not completely homogeneous. It's pretty close, but it's not there. So that means that the gravity of another object near it tends to pull the, the center of mass toward itself, not, not just the, the geometric uh, picture of it, but, but the center of the mass, not the center of the object, the, the geometric center, but the center of gravity, I should say. So as, as the moon does it, as the Earth, as the moon's spinning around, what happens is they both, and they both have the same thing going on. They both have a center of mass that's slightly different from the geometric centers. And as it turns out, over a course of time, those two do this. They can be wildly varying out here, but eventually they, they lock onto one another. So when you get an object like the moon that's very close, that slight difference is enough to cause the, the moon to all of a sudden where its, its rotation rate is exactly the same as our, one of our days. So you always see the same side. That wasn't a very good explanation. So that's what the dark side of the moon means. <coughs> so the center of mass of the moon is slightly closer to Earth than the geometric center of the moon. Uh, I'm, I may be oversimplifying it, but yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you, if you thought of a, of a plan as a football, then the points will come to each other because there's mountains on the planet. They're not spherical. And so um, that's, that's my explanation. Yeah, that. I, I, I wouldn't probably want to comment on that too much. I'm, I'm, I'm on shaky ground here, so. Carry on, friends. <laughs> um, okay. <coughs> we're, we're at the end, so I said. I have a friend that's Jewish, he's cool. <laughs> he doesn't speak Yiddish, but... <laughs> no. Evidence from evidence. Who cares? Well, the moon forming event happened uh, a long time ago. And there's no physical evidence of it whatsoever on the Earth. Uh, <laughs> because the Earth is too dynamic. I mean, Are you kidding? We don't have all this ammonia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You have weathering. You have volcanism, plate tectonic activity. The Earth has just basically been reformed many times since that event took place. It's all mixed up now. So filling in all the details is really left to computer modeling and indirect evidence. So where does that leave us? Well, uh, there is growing recognition that the extremely benign environment we find ourselves in appears to be the result of a rather uh, incredible sequence of finely tuned events. So incredible, in fact, that uh, there's a quote from a scientist, uh, his name is Tim Elliott at the University of Bristol. And he writes, the sequence of conditions that currently seems necessary in these revised versions of lunar formation have led to philosophical disquiet. <laughs> I love euphemisms. Maybe you have to be older and a little cynical to really appreciate you know, euphemisms, I don't know, but, uh, but this is a good one. 
I love that. Philosophical disquiet. What is that? <coughs> well, how does philosophical disquiet enter into a scientific discussion? Now, in, in fairness to Professor Elliot, I, I, I think what he means is that he's, he's bothered by the too many coincidences and, uh, uh, that are involved in this whole scenario, and he prefers a neat and simple and tidy little package to explain all this. I understand. Scientists are like it. They like elegance. You know, they don't like com complexity. They don't like coincidences. They don't like to try to explain all that. But my attitude is the state of science is what it is. I mean, this is, this is where science has led us to this point. And as in many other RTV presentations, we, we see evidence all over the place of fine-tuning uh, in the moon-forming event. And the uh, event resulted in fundamental changes that influenced the really large-scale processes on the Earth. So think about it, what we just talked about. The Earth's core, plate tectonics, magnetic field, tilt, stability of the tilt, water content, the atmosphere itself. And at this point, we can also begin to see the rationale behind uh, RTB's uh, predictions on what future discoveries will reveal when it comes to extrasolar planets. And Hugh Ross has, has very, very publicly come out and given his views on what scientists... And what's, what's the test of a theory anyway? It's, it's its ability to predict what you're going to find when you look into things. And, and what he says is that life of any kind in the cosmos will be very, very rare. And that intelligent life, far more rare if it exists at all. Now, it's really difficult for a lot of people to accept what we call the anthropic principle. And if you stick around our TV very long, this is a term you're going to hear over and over again. It is the proposition that our universe might have been designed for the sake of human life. Uh, and here's a quote from Hugh Ross on that subject. More than a century of astronomy and physics research yields this unexpected observation. The emergence of humans and human civilization requires physical constants, laws, and properties that fall within certain narrow ranges. And this truth not only applies to the cosmos as a whole, but also to just our galaxy our planetary system and this very planet that humans occupy. To state the principle more dramatically, a preponderance of physical evidence points to humanity as the single theme of the cosmos. That to me is a fantastic statement. You know, if I was a non-believer, I, I would read that when I would go... <laughs> but I think when you objectively view the evidence, that's, that's the conclusion you kind of are led to. So there's no doubt, and certainly in my mind, that <coughs> evidence for a uh, for supernatural design is getting stronger and not weaker as time goes on. And uh, it, but in in spite of that, uh, many scientists can and do claim that we are simply the product of fantastically good luck. <laughs> Real quick story. We're almost done. When I was in the army many years ago, <laughs> a galaxy far far away. It is a bit different galaxy. On one occasion, uh, we, well, we got paid in cash. Cash. Right down to the penny. Once a month. Get a report for pay. I hated it. Because my CEO always made me go get a haircut before he'd pay me. <laughs> on one occasion, now I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> on one occasion, uh, we, we worked at a site that was kind of remote. There weren't many bosses out there, so uh, we had lots of time on our hands, and so we pretty much did what we wanted to do during the day. And uh, on one of those days, after right after day after payday, uh, uh, things were a bit boring, and two of my friends started playing cards, blackjack, for money. And almost immediately, one of my friends started to lose, uh, lose hands. But he was convinced that his luck just had to change, <laughs> so he kept playing. Even after the other player, also a friend, uh, practically begged him to stop playing, he very angrily refused and he insisted on keeping the game going. So in less than an hour, I watched him lose his entire paycheck. So here we are uh, talking about science, yet all of a sudden that same science is suggesting outcomes that cause many people to feel discomfort. Well, discomfort can be a good thing. 
should have caused my friend in the army to quit playing while he still had money in his pocket. Discomfort can lead us to go to the doctor or the dentist. Uh, but to ignore, deny, or refuse to question the origin of that discomfort can be a dangerous thing. See, I think science oftentimes leads us on this evidentiary trail. We call them scientific breadcrumbs, is, is a phrase that I'm sure somebody else has used before me. Uh, and we've just discussed one of those, the just, just one. And that trail, I think, if you take it seriously, can lead to the very threshold of the kingdom of God. Or like the anecdote about my friend who insists his luck was about to change, uh, we can insist in a scientific sense on a trail down the path of scientific naturalism. Now, if my friend had had sufficient time and money, his luck would have eventually changed, I'm sure. But when it comes to life and eternity, it's not a card game. It's kind of a, if you want to look at it as a game, okay, but it's a, it's a rigged game. The writer of Hebrews says, just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. See, in this game, there's only one answer. There's only one truth. And there's only one God. And that truth doesn't change no matter how insistent or smart a person might be. Well, I know we just flew through this, but I hope it's been of some value to you. I hope you were able to pick out the... the, the the really important parts and kind of all the weeds we got into from time to time. Uh, and uh, I know it a number of scientific disciplines. But if you have any questions now, I'd be happy to take those for a few minutes. How long will Wally be up? Like 15 minutes? Uh, a little bit. 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, if you have comments or questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. All right, so meteorite, meteoroids versus, uh, meteorite showers versus and asteroids, what's the difference? And why, why, why do meteorite showers impact the atmosphere, but Trojan asteroids, except for like you know one chance and however many, don't. Uh, okay, try that again. All right, you mentioned Trojan asteroids orbit mm -hmm. with the planet ahead or behind it. Right. All right. So, but meteorites, Earth in, intersects several, at least two different areas where there are spatial bodies impacting the Earth's atmosphere right. every year. So what's the difference between those two? Well, every day of every year. I mean, uh, a lot of the particles which strike the atmosphere are they're literally dust. Okay. So, uh, you know, there's nothing that says uh, meet, uh, asteroids, if you want to call, okay, so meteors is after they strike the Earth, meteoroids when they impact the atmosphere. Meteorites when they're in outer space. No, it's meteorites no. when they're on the Earth. When you find no. when you find one laying on the ground, it's a meteorite. Uh, but in any case, uh, realize that that these a lot of these objects have been, if they're of any size, they, they've been they've been out there maybe since the beginning of the of the solar system. They just haven't crashed into anything yet. Space is a big place. Uh, some of them are not. They, they don't always are flying around in this ecliptic plane. You know, they're in, they, they're coming in from. They can be coming in from different directions, depending on how they originated. Okay, my question is, why does Earth have regular meteorite showers at certain particular parts of the year? Like the Perseids and the... Oh, okay. Or... Oh, okay. I, I'm going to kind of guess on this. Okay. Uh, but they probably, those, those meteorites were probably part of a larger body at one time that got broken up. Okay. And that larger body would have intersected our orbit at some point in any case. All right. But now it's all broken up, so you see a succession of smaller particles hitting okay. the atmosphere instead of just one big wave. So... It had an orbit that intersected <coughs> Earth's orbit, and that's when you have meteorite showers versus these Trojan asteroids, which are literally caught in the exact same orbit. Yeah, they're basically the stuck there. Body. They do occasionally get knocked out, uh, but you know, for the large, for the most part, yeah, they're stuck there. Okay, I got a question. The uh, I, I don't quite understand this forty-five degree angle thing. The, you have this Mars-sized planet, the, uh, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. and it's in the same orbit as Earth, right? Yeah. So is it going faster than Earth or slower than Earth, or we don't know? Well, I've actually seen uh, computer-generated 
uh, simulations of that. And uh, here's the sun and the earth in its orbit. And let's just say you have these 60 degree points. Let's we'll say that's where Thea formed right there. And uh, of course, you realize it's a complex situation because you've, you've got the influence of the gravity of the sun, influence of the gravity of the earth, influence of the gravitational pull, even of Jupiter up there. It's just so darn big. And so, what you would find, and I saw in one simulation, is this guy actually ends up here doing this. Oh. Yeah. And then crashes in. So it's not the pretty orbit that we think of. No, nice it, didn't get, it didn't get perturbed and then just sort of, you know, <laughs> flying to the Earth. It, it, under, it undergoes what we call, they, they call them orbital resonances, where they kind of go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So that's Until finally they get close enough to something. Remember, gravity is not, is not exerting the same force. Its gravity is by the what power or the distance I can get. Yeah. And I'm wondering, um, I don't know if you answered this or not, are, are there instances in the galaxy where we can view now where there's that kind of a moon forming or we could see anything that looks like a moon forming in other I think one. I think a moon has, they think they have detected a moon uh, orbiting uh, at one of the exoplanets, uh, but it hasn't been confirmed yet. Sean? So I've heard Hugh Ross um, talk about this concept a couple times on videos, like YouTube and stuff. One time I remember him saying something about, like, if we were able to go to the moon, we could find fossils. Like, if we were able to dig yeah. in here. What, can you elaborate on that? I mean, I just yeah. don't have the information. Uh, okay. Uh, let me transfer that to Mars, because I think it's a little bit better example. Mm -hmm. Everybody's always excited because I think we're about ready to discover well, maybe not life, but evidence of life the fossils, on, on, on our fossils, <laughs> maybe. Okay. So uh, the perception, I think, probably in the public mind anyway, is that if we find such a thing, oh, life, life came to be on Mars, just like it did on Earth. Um, well, that's, I suppose that's po that is possible. Uh, but it's just as likely and probably more likely that what any evidence of life we find there will have come from the Earth. Why do I say that? Because we find what, what we are pretty convinced are meteorites from Mars here on Earth. Well, does anybody think that, that if we can get a meteorite from Mars here, that we can't get a meteorite from Earth there? <laughs> the Earth is, after all, much larger than Mars. And it's probably been impacted as much, or probably a lot more, than Mars, just because of its gravitational pull, uh, over the history of the solar system. And some of those impacts have been large, very large, enough to eject material from the Earth into outer space. There's absolutely no reason why those can't make their way to Mars. In fact, statistically, the chances are much better <coughs> than the reverse. Um, does that answer? Not quite. I was I was thinking it had something to do with you know fossils being preserved in that first what did you say ten to twenty million years younger right? Uh -huh. So that's what I thought he was talking. No, about. I don't. I don't. Because I was thinking, how could they survive an impact? Like that? Well, even no. How, how how could there be fossils that old? I mean, are we talking vertebrates? If not, if we're talking that, they came a lot. I, I don't, I don't that's why I was so I don't curious really about that, an answer for I don't this. Think anybody's proposing that that. Life. Well, okay. I mean, if you're one of these, uh, remember we use the term panspermia, people that believe that life came to Earth from some other places. Mm. If you want to adopt that stance and say, well, if life came from somewhere else, it could have come really, 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 really early and then got destroyed. Well, yeah, it could have, but there's no evidence. So, uh, yeah. so Hugh, Hugh Ross is just talking about, I've heard him say this before. Yeah. Too. I've heard a little more in depth on okay. the podcast. Well, he just talked about exactly what Fred was talking about but not to Mars, but to the moon. In other words, you could have some, you know, whatever killed the dinosaurs, whatever it is, you know, spewed up all sorts of stuff. Some of that stuff ends on the, on the, on the moon. Uh, astronauts go there someday, and they find a fossil there, say, hey, look, this is a fossil. And, you know, you don't immediately conclude that life was, you know, Originated. dinosaurs were walking around that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like, the, like the Chick fluid impact could have taken some fossils. It's much later than the formation of the moon. And it's during the while the vertebrates were around. Mm -hmm. so, but well, it was about three three point eight billion is really the earliest evidence of life. About three point eight billion years ago. Probably we're not. Which we're well not after the dinosaur bones. There we're talking microscopic. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, has there been accusations of uh, the validity of the existence of God using this model? Because it seems like it's very accidental. If if God did exist, why did he have to use a a kind of a a formation of the moon to bring more anthropic, you know, uh, essence to the earth rather than just having it without the need of a moon? Yeah, we probably asked that question in many different senses. You know, over history, why did God do things a certain way as opposed mm -hmm. to another? Did, why did he Why did he use so many quote natural uh, phenomena to to advance his purposes? Right. Or, I'm not sure I can answer the question. Answer oh, that question. I, 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 I don't know. Uh, Alan, do you have a do you have a response to that? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think I would just echo what you said. In, in many ways, we have to say we don't know why God did it a certain way. Um, but that doesn't change the evidence that the, the best, um, the, the most reasonable uh, uh, answer for, for explaining what the available evidence that we have is that a, a creator made this, this stuff, made the, the, you know, the earth and the right kind of moon and the right kind of solar system and the right kind of galaxy and the right kind of universe with the right kind of natural forces so that life can exist. I think the Bible is fairly plain on that answer. It's right at the center of the gospel. For God so loved the cosmos. And he likes to do things according to the rules of nature. He likes to do things providentially. Well, it's interesting, too, in Genesis, where it talks about not only did he give us these sun and moon as lights, I mean, but they were given as, as <coughs> ways to mark seasons and ways to, to um, value time. And, and that's really marked cultures for all throughout history. You know, the harvest moon and the full moon and the, you know, all this stuff. That, and, and people didn't have clocks and, you know, watches and stuff <laughs> that ways to, to kind of mark time and I think that that's part of it too maybe culturally so then going back to uh, the young earth cosmology how do they explain not necessarily the formation of the moon but the formation of the, the cosmos because I know they reject the theory of Big Bang and so what how do they how do they account for the cosmos well I mean there are still of course you know it's like which which faction do you even listen to? Even, you know, even the young Earth people have different factions. Uh, That's true. Some of them believe that the sun rotates around the Earth. I mean, I've seen the website. So yeah. I, Seriously. I know. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, many of them will believe that you know they answer the starlight problem, you know, the, the light transit time problem by saying, well, God created it in place. In transit. In transit. And then he so I assume like they, would, they, would, they would go on with having created the rest of the cosmos. Uh, instantaneous creation. That, you know, <laughs> they, they may, there's probably other answers too. I don't. Now, it's like, why is there a question if, if it's created instantly? Why would that be a question? Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's a static universe, we're denying the red shift that we see because we see blue shift as well why would we even ask how this came about other than God created so, so their explanation is, is much more or is less descriptive more kind of a just well God just kind of did it it is not that not scientific it's a less predictive they, prediction they, or that they don't they don't have a scientific testable. model yeah they don't have a testable uh, model I do think that, that, um, that you know the Bible has something to say uh, about you know w what we can observe, in as much as it says the heavens declare the glory of God, and and of course it's glorious to say that God did things by fiat, just there it is. But I don't know in my mind that it's so complex. I mean that 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 our most complicated mathematical equations have taken us hundreds and thousands of years uh, to to develop. You know how all this stuff worked out. Um, uh, to me, that that owes more glory to God than just, you know, that for, as an explanation. I mean, there's just so much for us to marvel at the magnif magnificence and power and intelligence of God by seeing how all this stuff came together. That's my view. 
when we look at the at the at the intricacies of the anthropic principle, God gets a lot more glory than by saying, "Boom, there it is." He gets a lot more glory. I think so. We wouldn't it changed my life. Talking about this stuff, listening to this presentation, asking ourselves about this, if he hadn't done it in this way. That's how I look at it. Yeah, it's funny. I always call it the bread crumb thing. It's like God could miraculously introduce himself to everybody individually in a way that was unmistakable, but instead he chooses to reveal himself in parts, kind of in a game kind of way, because, you know, that's, that's his way to do that. And a part of it is about is is building our character, preparing us for another life and a new creation. And it's part of our getting to know him. We need to go through that process, a discovery process. I think it's kind of interesting. I'm still thinking about this whole thing about, I think maybe Danny was thinking about, I don't know, but about scientists could look at, okay, let's say we know exactly how the moon was formed and we know how the impact happened. Well, I've heard a lot of these physicists and stuff now say, we don't need a dog, because we understand it all. Science explains it all. It's like, I'm just thinking about that. Is that, is that, even, a, a log, is that even logically valid? Where, is that actually an argument? In other words? Because I think they're saying it's if you understand it, how somebody did something, that means you don't need the somebody anymore. Oh, I don't you know I mean. It's, can I, can I yeah. offer an explanation? It's because people have this conception of, of quote unquote, God as being like, ineffable, indescribable. And so because of that, if you can describe it, then they say, well, therefore, it's not, it's not God, because they have this idea that God can't be understood. And instead, the Bible says God is the truth, and uh, so therefore, every time you can learn about the truth, you're learning about God. But if the whole universe could be explained by the laws of physics, I still don't, I still think there's still room for God because somebody had to make those laws of physics and fine tune them and all that kind of stuff. Well, that, that's kind of the just, problem, anyways. Is just because you say we don't need God anymore, I mean, you, you could do that <coughs> in a lot of ways. You could come upon a dead body and you could come up with some, you know, uh, a, a extraordinary example of how that person died by natural causes and all this stuff came together. Well, I guess we don't need a killer anymore. But, but, you know, but that doesn't mean that's the best explanation. Just because you can say we no longer need God doesn't mean that no God is the best explanation. Or if all the evidence points more and more and more to the fact that there is a killer, then and you say, well, there, the more and more we learn about how it points that there's a killer, therefore we don't need a killer. It's not a killer. There's no killer. Does that make sense? I mean, that, that, to me, that's the contradiction. That's the illogic that I'm talking about. If you, if you use the forensic science and... When you have that evidence versus well, this there's evidence, a, there's a slight like difference, favorite. though, because what scientists, what a physicist, atheist physicist would say is that we don't. We, you may have a killer, but I can explain everything with something else, some some some, some natural things that happen. I can explain the whole murder or the whole death, not a murder or whatever. I can explain it all this other way. So so there's a little difference there. It does that mean it's the best explanation? Yeah. But again, yeah. again the best in respect the best explanation, just because there's an alternative doesn't mean that that's the better explanation than this one. Well, I think you have to go a step further. You've got those natural <coughs> causes that cause it. Now you get to say, well, what, what caused those natural causes? Maybe there's a killer that caused all those natural causes, too. Yeah. Well, that's what uh, J.P. Mormon says. You, you know, science could only give you the, uh, the immediate causes, but they won't give you the final causes, which includes motivation for... You know the reason behind the creation. That's what we always talk about. Whereas science, they're always like, "Well, the immediate cause is this," and we don't need to step back and, and see the final cause because they can't explain it in the first place, right? We always say, "Well, it takes a, a personal you know, to to create something is a, is a personal choice, and a non-personal force doesn't decide one day to create something." So, you know, science can't say that, and I think that's maybe their kind of defensive way to kind of dismiss the notion of final comment. Any questions for Fred? Yeah. Can, I ask, can I ask a quick question? So uh, I've always heard about this, is it called the late heavy bombardment? The late heavy bombardment? Yeah, I've always heard that. It's connected with the stuff yeah. that you mentioned. So. Well, the late heavy bombardment, uh, <coughs> or, or aware of it, the, 
of course, the early solar system was characterized by by just constant collisions between um, astronomical or, uh, bodies and, and part of the secretion disk. Uh, but as uh, as as more and more of them coalesced or struck planet planets and, and and added to their mass, the solar system began to be kind of began to be cleared out of a lot of these asteroids. And so you find if you were to look at a chart, look at it from your perspective, if you look at the rate at which asteroids are striking the Earth, you know they they're they're initially very very high, and then they reach a peak, and then they start to tail off. You know, again, as the orbit of the Earth gets kind of cleaned out, then all of a sudden it, it goes back up again, and it and it and it ex, it, that extends out for our, I think a few hundred billion, a couple hundred million years before it really drops off precipitously, precipitously, and that little hump there is called the late heavy bombardment, and they think it was they don't know why it happened, but it may have had something to do with the fact that. You know, when you look at the positioning of the planets uh, in the solar system now, that's probably not the way they were. Probably not formed that way. In fact, they think that both Jupiter and Saturn have both moved. And they think it was the movement of one of these large gases, large gas planets that disturbed... Uh, uh, I, I, I don't remember which... There's a, there, there are groups of asteroids now in the in the solar system that we can identify with names for them, and it perturbed one of those groups of asteroids and shot them in toward the inner solar system, and that's how the Earth ended up getting bombarded again. Okay. Does that make sense? Is that again the orbital resonances type of thing? Or uh, something different? No, uh, I think that's something different. Uh, we know that now Jupiter plays an important part in actually shielding the Earth from asteroids because of its massive gravitational field. It tends to either pull them in and, and they strike Jupiter, or it pulls them in really close and they get slingshotted right out of the solar system rather than entering the, early, the, the uh, inner solar system where they might strike the Earth. So does the moon play a similar protective role at all? Uh, it's only about one. It the mass of I the moon, even, is very. It's what I can't. I, I can't remember what. It I is. think if we look at the back side of the moon, it's way more pitted than the front side. Front side, the back side is. It's more. It, actually, there's a there's an incredibly large giant crater back there, which they think was a very large impactor that struck the back side of the moon uh, after it was formed. It created a magma ocean. Does the non? I'm sorry. Does a non-rotating Properties of the moon have any anthropic contribution? I mean, what? Anthropic contribution, or would it, or is it just a fluke that it just doesn't? Uh, you know, if it I was, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I bet mean, RTB has something like some, something on that, but I've never, I've never read that. I, I know one of the things that Hugh Ross is always fond of pointing out, though, is that the, the incredible coincidence that the moon is the exact size it is, because it, when we have eclipses, the, the moon. Exactly, <laughs> eclipse it to the point where you can absolutely just see the corona of the sun and allow us to stay there. What are the chances of the moon being exactly that size? I mean, I don't know. It's just a detail. Well, it's at this, it's at this point because the moon is progressing away from the Earth. That's right. And when science, when people got to the point where they were asking about the sun, <coughs> the moon was right there <coughs> to uh, show us just the corona. And now we can make our own graphs and stuff like that, but we didn't know about that before. It's kind of maybe a gift from God that he showed us. Yeah, this whole thing of timing, that, that's a whole different subject. And Hugh Ross, the, Hugh Ross likes to point out that, that even our timing, our spot in the cosmos, in this galaxy, uh, at this particular time, makes a lot of things possible that wouldn't be possible earlier or later. I was saying, that like billiard balls again, if, if the moon originally had a spin, uh, being as proximal as it was to the Earth, that spin would uh, be, be like English being transferred, like left-hand English creates right-hand English on a ball uh, that struck, right? So the spin of the moon would have affected the spin of the Earth. And, yeah, as, and as, that, as that changed, uh, that would affect yeah. the total spin of the Earth when it, when it finally came to a stable position now. It's, it's sort of uh, locked in. Well, that's a good question. Yeah. I, I, 
you know, the, the, the billiard course. ball thing is not a real good example because that's a almost a perfectly elastic collision, mm -hmm. like the cards you were playing with earlier. Uh, whereas sure. the planets colliding is not going to be elastic at all, and or not much. And uh, so I don't know if the spin. I mean, you realize that when they contact one another. Well, I didn't mean in the contact, but after it was actually in orbit around the Earth, oh. but it did have spin. Oh, well, maybe. Sure. Um, that I'm, would. I'm, I'm sure that influenced something. As the moon sure. lost spin. Um, well, there, there, you know, he was just saying in his presentation that Earth used to rotate every two hours or six hours, and now it's every 24 hours. I, I'm not saying that it all happened right at the collision, but a lot of it. And now the tides uh, from the slow of the moon, from the pull of the moon, slow the Earth a little bit. Yeah. So the Earth is slowing down, and it's not uncommon for planets to be to be uh, tidally locked, where they always face each other. Anyway. Well, let's go ahead and um, wrap up the official part of the meeting, and then we can stay and linger and talk. I don't want to interrupt that at all. But we'll be mindful of people's time and have to go with uh, time constraints. So I had a couple of announcements, if I could. I'm,